There we go. Now I think we're recording. Right? Yep. All right. <laughs> Technology. I will get used to it by the end of this pandemic. So, hi, my name is Marty Elberg, and as Gray said, I am of counsel with the Whistler Law Firm. And I'm here to uh, speak with you about estate planning, specifically uh, seven, seven steps to keep your child safe. So if you have children or know somebody that has children under the age of 18, you are in the right place. We're going to discuss how to keep your kids safe or what happens to your kids um, when you're gone. So let's get right into it. First, actually, since we are attorneys, um, nothing in this presentation should be interpreted as legal advice. This presentation is intended to help you understand the area of law, to help you ask the right questions with the attorney of your choice. Okay, please keep that in mind as we go through the uh, presentation. So like I said, seven steps to protect your child when you are gone. Why, you might ask. Why do we need to do anything to protect our child? I know everybody thinks that, uh, oh, my family's in place, I have family, I'm married, I have a sister that said they're gonna step up and take care of my kid if something ever happened to me. That may well be the fact, but there are a lot of processes that go um, in, the, in the decision of who gets to take care of your child and how they get to take care of your child. See um, the little box down there on the bottom left, or yeah, bottom left, uh, it says probate. Probate handles everything that has to do with somebody dying as well as somebody being named as a guardian. A lot of times we think of guardianships over older people who are incapacitated, maybe that have Alzheimer's or have had a, a major stroke and they can't take care of themselves. Well, probate guardianship also covers caring for a minor child when they've lost a parent. Okay, so if there are two parents, the default is of course going to be the other parent. And in most cases, that's okay. But in some cases where the child has been abandoned basically by the other parent, whether it's the mom or the dad, that parent still has first right to that child, unless there's been some type of interaction or intervene, intervenement or intervening by the, by the state in a dependency case. And you will know if that's the case with, with what you have or somebody that you know, because they'll have talked about the state came in, they took the kid, social workers got involved, they did a termination of parent, parental rights. So that parent might not have access to the child, but a parent that's just taken off, say a year ago, two years ago, and, had, 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 and has had no contact with the child or the existing parent, well, that parent still has rights because they haven't been terminated. Now, they might have a little bit of a struggle in the court, but they are the first one on the list. The other parent always wins out over others unless they can be proven to be so detrimental that that child would go back to that parent that it's not a good fit. So there's going to be a court battle. This actually happened with a, a client of mine. They were just getting ready to adopt a child. Um, when the dad, who was a convicted, convicted felon, actually went to court and said, hey, that's my kid. My ex-wife died, and that's my kid. I want my kids. Well, the judge, without really looking into it or even having a, an initial hearing, automatically on that guy's petition assigned him rights to the children. So he went and picked up the kids. Um, Luckily or unluckily, uh, there was a disturbance in his hotel room and the police came and they ended up removing the children and they placed them back with my clients. They hadn't had an opportunity to get their, uh, their documents done yet. So luckily, uh, they were able to work through the court system and, and get that all worked out. Now, had the children's mother set up something 
um, before she died, it would have gone a lot smoother. There would have been a lot more um, evidence to show that the brother should have had the kids instead of the, um, the children's fathers. So um, I haven't talked to him in a while, but it, it was at least six months to a year before everything um, started to get calm uh, and the children stopped being put in the middle of it. And that's really the problem, the tug of war over the children and who should get the children. Um, because oftentimes there is a financial tie to that if it's a parent that's abandoned the children. So that is why we are here today to talk about what happens to your children when you're gone, okay? So this is a brief overview of what can happen. All right, so what we wanna do is name a proper guardian for our child, all right? So there are two types of guardianships here in Florida. There's a guardianship over the child and there's a guardianship over the finances. That person or that, those two roles can be fulfilled with the same person or two different people. You may have one person that is great with kids but horrible with finances. You might not want that person looking over the finances for that child. You may have the other person that's great with the finances, but not so good with kids. So you can use two different people to fulfill these roles, all right? So you want to make a list of all people that would fit both of those roles. So either or, or both of those roles. So once you have that list, um, and the, the list should consist of everybody from everywhere in your life, your friends, your family, maybe even your colleagues at work. Um, don't leave this list short. You can, you're, we're gonna go through the next few steps so you'll be able to whittle down who is actually the best choice for your child, okay? For the financial as well as for the caring for the child. So. Don't leave anybody out just because you think, oh, I don't think they're the right person or oh, they're too old. Um, because that's in, that's in this portion of um, what, or this is in the next step. You're going to review each name. You're gonna go through the list that I have here. So you're gonna look at the age. Are they too old to care for the child? Are they too young to take care of the child? Are they too, you know, caught up in going to school? Are they just getting their career started? Um, how about their physical ability? Are they going to be able to run around and, and chase after a two-year-old, a five-year-old, an eight-year-old? Are they going to want to put up with a teenager? Um, so you got to look at the physical ability, the emotional stability. Are they married or single? Sometimes uh, parents want to have a couple. So they have a married couple that they have uh, selected as their primary person that they want to take care of their kids. Then I ask, okay, what if they get divorced? What if one of them dies? And sometimes the answer is, is different. It changes from, well, okay, I don't want them anymore. But if the husband survives, I want the child to go with the husband. If they both die, well, then we've got to move on to another choice. So married couples, single people, if they're married and they, they separate who um, of the married couple would you want to be the person, okay? Uh, or do you want them to share? And that, that can happen too. If the married couple gets divorced, as of right now, you know, we have uh, uh, shared custody. You can change that or you can, uh, you can describe that's how you want it to happen. If they happen, happen to get divorced, then, then they can share, share care. Or, nope, if they get divorced, we're gonna move on to somebody else, okay? Where they live, not necessarily the house, but where in the country, in the world, do these people live? Oh, I just uh, signed a couple of estate plans this morning where the, the next of kin and the only people they trusted to have their children um, are in Australia. So we've got, so we've got the, the aunt and uncle, in Australia and they're named as the guardians for the kids. They don't have anybody here in the United States because they just moved here. Um, so they're, they're, they're working through some of those things and, and hopefully they'll get some uh, good ties to people around 
town, or at least in the state, uh, that they can at least name for a short-term guardian. Okay, finances. Finances should not be as heavy of a factor as a lot of people think. Um, there are other ways to make sure your kids are financially secure. You can have life insurance, you can use your 401k, you can use a lot of different uh, tools to make sure they're financially set. So just because somebody has a lot of money does not mean they're going to be the best person to take care of your child, all right? They might be a really good person to take care of the financial side of things, but maybe not the best person to take care of your child. Family values is huge, especially for the ones taking care of your child. What, uh, what do you want them to have? Do you want them to, to you know, go to church? Do you want them, what religion do you want them to be raised under? Um, do you want them to be raised in a religious home or a, a secular home? So look at all of those things. Uh, family values can also be, are they charitable? Do they um, belong to any civic organizations? Do they give back to the community? Do they participate in any community events? What do they do? How are they um, portraying exactly how you would want your child to be raised? Okay? Financial experience, this really goes for the person that is taking care of the finances, so the guardianship over the finances. Um, same with good with money and good with real estate. If you own real estate, you wanna make sure you have somebody that understands how to either sell the real estate or how to manage it if they can actually turn it into an income producing vehicle. Sometimes the person that's the guardian may move into the home. It's totally up to you. You can set this up any way you want with the proper planning tools. And so make sure you go through each name, each name and go through all of these um, criteria and make sure you're choosing the best one, right? So you're gonna choose the top three or four in the next step. Um, and it's up to you, you might wanna to go to five, you might only wanna to go to two or three, but it's up to you to select how many you're going to do this with. But you're going to have a conversation, a real conversation, not, hey Bob, I named you as the guardian for my kid. All right, great, all right, bye. You really want to get into detail about how you want them to take care of your child and the expectations you have. It's important that they understand the meaning of what you are, um, what you are assigning them. Some people just think, oh, it's just some, I'm going to step in, I'm going to take care of them for a while, and, and then I'm going to give them to their grandma. No, you are the one. You are the chosen one. You are the one that's going to raise my kid until they turn 18 and uh, go out on their own. And as we all know, if you've got older children or know somebody that has older children, they don't always leave the house at 18. It could be 21, 22, 25, and then they come back. So make sure they understand that they are really becoming this child's parent. And it's a lot of responsibility, especially for somebody that doesn't have children or somebody that already has a lot of children. So the conversation really should be detailed enough so they understand and so that you are comfortable that they understand how big this job is, all right? So you have the conversation with your top people and judging by that, you're gonna be able to whittle it down to your, your um, primary, okay? So what I mean by primary is this is the person, this is the person that is going to be in for the long run. They are going to have these kids until, like I said, until they reach 18 or leave the house. So at least one primary, and it could be a couple. So if it's gonna be a couple, you need to be clear on that as well. And at least one alternative. I suggest two alternatives, okay? So an alternative is if for some reason, Further down the road, this person decides, hey, you know what, I know I said that then, but you ended up living longer than <laughs> the conversation really allowed. So 
uh, we want you to live a long and healthy life and never have to use this. Um, but sometimes life changes things. And if you haven't kept up with those conversations, maybe it's five years down the road, that person says, well, now I have my own family or I had a financial issue, I had a health issue, so I can't take care of your kid. So then we have an alternate. So the alternate can step in and now they are the ones that will take care of your kids. So if that alternate's not available and you haven't named somebody, now we're back into the court system. So naming as many alternates as you can is fantastic. I usually try to limit it to two or three and just make sure you're in constant contact with your primary and your alternate, okay? Your alternates. So we wanna make sure we have primary and alternate. And remember the married couple or couple and single. We also want to have a short-term guardian. Remember the clients I was talking about that their guardian was in Australia? Well, we really need a short-term guardian. That means somebody that can pick your kid up if you don't get home from work that day. Okay, this is when I sit down with clients, I often ask them, okay, who would pick your child up if you got in an accident on 95 and you didn't pick them up from daycare? Who would be that, who would that person be? And that really stops a lot of people. They look at me kind of in horror and say, I don't know. <laughs> or they say, well, we have somebody there, the emergency contact at the daycare. And I say, fantastic. That might be your perfect short-term guardian. Could be a neighbor, could be one of your kid's friends' parents. It can be pretty much anybody because really what their job is to do is to get that child, make sure they're safe and keep them comfortable until the long-term guardian can get there. Okay, it could be a day, it could be a week. So that's something you wanna have a conversation with them. And they don't even have to be uh, the people on your, um, permanent guardian list, which is why I said don't, don't, uh, don't leave anybody off your initial list because they could be a perfect short-term guardian, all right? Now that you know that, you can go back and look at your list and you can add short-term people for it. The next step is, of course, where we would come in um, as estate planning attorneys, and we would properly draft the correct documents, all right? So there are a few that um, will serve the purpose. Uh, you can do a declaration of guardian for your minor, minor child. You can, of course, do a will or sometimes called a last will and testament. And you can also uh, create a trust, also known as a revocable trust or a living trust or living revocable trust. All of them are pretty much the same thing. You know, there are other types of specialty trusts, but we're really dealing, I'm just going to talk about our, our basic type of trust that'll handle finances, okay? <clears throat> Let's just go into Declaration of Guardian. This person is one that you've chosen from that long list that you whittled down to three or four, and then you have your primary and an alternate. That is what this document is for. We'll name your primary, we'll name your alternates, so it's, and your short term, if you have a short term. So who's gonna pick your kid up from school or daycare or wherever your kid is? Who's going to come pick them up and have them live with them? And then who's gonna be our backup? That is all that document does. We also have a medical document to make those people, uh, to, to allow those people to get medical attention for the children. Okay, so that's all that document does. Only cares for your child. It's a very important document, but it's limited in what it does. Now, once that document <clears throat> kicks in, so if something happens to you, and it doesn't have to be your death either. It can be incapacitation. Remember I gave you the example of driving down 95. So many people around the, the South Florida area understand 95 and understand what happens there. So 
if you just happen to get into a car accident and are in a coma. You're incapacitated. You're not able to care for your children. So this document can name that person to step in and take care of your child. Now, unfortunately, even with this document, we have to go to probate court to get the guardianship enacted so that it's a legal guardianship. A piece of paper will work for maybe a couple days until somebody actually asks if you have an order from a court. Um, so this is the document you would go to get an order from the court appointing you or appointing your person as the guardian. Um, it makes it a lot easier when the court has something to look at because it's a direction from you. But unfortunately, we still have to go through the process. It will streamline it and we'll cut out some of the, the side fighting as well, okay? As far as the finances, we still have to go get a guardian for the finances as well. <clears throat> so if you haven't named somebody specifically for finances in another document, and we're gonna talk about that in the next couple of documents, um, the court will determine who will take care of the finances. And it's usually gonna be just that same person that you've named on your declaration of guardian. So the probate court will determine financial and over the child. Our next one is a will. Now the will only takes effect when you die. So if you're killed in that car accident on 95, uh, then your will will kick in. And you will also name a guardian inside your will. It'll be the same people we named inside the declaration of guardian. Um, naming your your primary your and your alternates as well okay we don't need a short well we do need a short term sorry we do need a short term um, if they are far away and you can also gift your assets inside your will so your will can transfer your assets you can say i want my kids to have all of this money um, if you transfer the assets directly to your kids and they're under 18 then we have an issue that now they have some finances, finances that they need to get taken care of. So then we go to probate, to probate your will, to transfer your assets to the people that you want them to transfer to, as well as get that guardian appointed. But now we're dealing with two different probate cases. We have a probate case with the guardian, and we have a probate case to transfer your assets. Those are two separate cases and that's really important to understand a lot of people think because they have a will they don't have to go through probate that is not true the truth is that the will only gives direction on how you want your assets to transfer and who you want to take care of your kids okay? we still have to go through probate and in the will, you can name somebody specifically to take care of the finances for your minor children. So it doesn't always have to be the person that you named in the Declaration of Guardian. Now, the best resource that we have um, for family planning is a revocable trust. Because with the revocable trust, we can avoid at least one of those probate cases. We can avoid the probate case regarding assets, regarding finances, real estate, um, any, type of, any type of asset, okay? We still will have to go to the guardianship court for the guardian over the child. But if we set up a revocable trust, we are really in essence setting up a financial guardian, also known as a successor trustee, not going to get too involved in the makings of a trust because we're really talking about how to protect your child. If you want more information about how to set up a trust or a will or even a guardianship uh, declaration of guardian, you can always contact me. Um, Gray has put in a link to set up a time to meet with me. And this will be a one-to-one -one conversation that we'll have. Um, I can answer many of your questions uh, usually in a short amount of time. There are um, so many different things we can do to protect your family's well-being, and um, this is one of the best tools we have. So you can select a financial guardian, 
like I said, it's a successor trustee. Uh, they will be the ones that step in, not by going to probate court, not by getting appointed as a guardian, but getting appointed as you when you set this trust up. So you name this person to come in and take care of your children's finances. So you allow them to pay for anything health related, welfare, um, and education. So the trustee has really the authority to use reasonable discretion, of course, um, to pay for any of these expenses for your child. And then once your child reaches a certain age, a lot of times depend, well, it depends on how much, uh, how much wealth the person has. So if they have over 250,000, you might want to set it up as disbursements from certain ages. So what that means is um, at 25, they get a third of whatever's in that pool of money for them. At 30, they get another third, which is really about half of whatever's in that pool of money for that child. And at 35, they get the rest. And somewhere along the line, they get to be a co-trustee. So they would join that successor trustee and they would learn how to actually manage their asset. Hopefully they've figured this out along the way so it's not blown, but that's why we sometimes stagger uh, the disbursements. Some parents just say, no, at 25, they can have it all. At 21, they can have it all. At 30, they can have it all. I've had uh, clients, um, I've heard of clients. I, didn't work with this particular client, but I worked with a relative of them. Um, the mom said, no, nope, they get everything at 65. <laughs> and of course we asked, why 65? And her response was, well, I want them to work throughout their life. And at 65, I want them to have a very comfortable retirement. So she was thinking way ahead for their children, for her children. So. It's up to you. You get to make that choice. The best thing about it is you get to make the choice of who it is. Now, I forgot to tell you about a little bit about my story, but I'll throw it in here because this is exactly where I woke up. So, <laughs> woke up in law school. So I didn't go to law school until I was 35. I just uh, got done with a divorce that, that was, we had a pretty terrible custody issue. And that's why I went to law school. Well, I was sitting in my trust and estates class, so wills, trusts, and estates, where we learn about all this stuff. And uh, the professor started talking about being able to name somebody to take care of your kid and being able to name somebody to take care of your finances for the kid and, and really just threw in, it does not need to be the other parent. And that's just what I always thought the default is was, and that is what the default is. Um, so I woke up, I was like, wow, I, I, I can literally rule from the grave. I can say, okay, my kids, he was eight at the time and his mother, uh, is, was not the most financially responsible person. I'll just put it that way. Uh, we have a great relationship now, but that's been several years later. Um, so I, I really did. I woke up and I was like, wow, this class it can mean a lot to a lot of people. So you get to choose who runs the finances for your child. Um, if you're divorced and on this, uh, on this presentation, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You don't necessarily want that other parent to run the finances. The other parent is the default guardian over the child, remember that. But they do not need to be the default financial guardian. And the revocable trust is the best tool I know to set that up so that they are not, okay? So you get to choose. So we've got the, like just a recap. We've got the disbursements for the health, welfare, and education. We've got disbursements, which is the big chunks of money. And it can be all at once. It can be a third, a half, the rest. Uh, we can do pretty much anything you want with that. The last benefit of this for your child is that it provides asset protection for your child. When we set up trusts like this, it doesn't really provide us asset protection, but when we die, think of it as a nice bubble that's protecting this money. This money that's left for the health, welfare, and education of your child. If that child turns 20, 21, 
25 and he's the cause of an accident somewhere down the line, or he's sued for whatever reason, or has a bunch of credit card debt and gets sued for the credit card debt uh, and you're not around. Well, the trust can hang on to that money instead of giving it to the child, it can hang on to the money and your successor trustee can say, no, you have not been responsible with your money. I am not paying you. Because the second the trustee pays the child, who's now an adult, of course, the creditor can come in and take that money. Now the child doesn't have that for their health, welfare, and education. So we put provisions inside the trust that allow the trustee to withhold those big disbursements at the certain age. So that kid reaches 25 and they've got a bunch of creditor debt. The trustee can say, nope, we've been watching you. You don't have proper credit. We don't want your creditors coming in and getting your parents hard earned money. So we're gonna hang on to this. We'll still pay for whatever you need us to pay for, but we're not giving it to you directly, okay? That creditor asset protection is a huge advantage for families. So please make sure you keep that in mind when you're thinking about um, setting up a trust. It's a great opportunity. A lot of people wanna pass on setting up a trust because it's a little bit more expensive, but it's not, ex it's, it's not expensive at all if you look at um, the grand scheme of things. All right. So the final step, now that we've got the documents prepared, we're going to give a copy to the people we select. So we want to make sure that the, the people we've named as the guardian, the people we've named as successor trustee, if you went and set up a trust, um, the people we've named in the will, you don't have to give them a copy of your will, but let them know, hey, we've named you as a guardian for the child, and we're going to do it in both documents anyway. So they're going to have a copy of that. And then if anything does happen to you, they've got it. They know that they are going to jump in, be in action, be able to take that to the court and get assigned as the legal guardian with an order because that's what everybody's going to want. Okay, Daycare is going to want it. School is going to want it. If you move, medical providers are going to want it. So they need a copy of what you have. All right. So that is really in a nutshell what we need to do. So when should you name your, your uh, guardian for your children? So I, I um, was going to ask how many of you that are participating here or, or watching this uh, little webinar have kids? Type yes in the, uh, in the chat room. If you've got kids that are under 18, type yes. And if you've got children that are over 18, type, okay, good. Somebody, Wendy said not under 18. So just say over 18 if you have children over 18. And I'll talk, and since, since we have a couple of you here, I'll talk a couple minutes about that. So the proper time for planning is now. It doesn't matter what your health is right now. We always want to do things when we're healthy because when we're not healthy, if we ever become incapacitated, it's too late. I've had far too many people with early set Alzheimer that their, their children bring them in or they, they want me to talk to them and they're, it's too late. I can't do anything for them because they're not of sound mind. We've all heard not of sound mind. They don't have full mental capacity. So if you don't have mental capacity, if you don't have physical capacity to even be able to have a conversation with an attorney about setting up uh, an estate plan, then it's too late. That's why we do it now. A lot of people say, well, if I do it, then something's going to happen to me. And yeah, we all have beliefs that, that we want to hang on to. But uh, my belief is whenever I take an umbrella out and it's shiny, sunshiny, it's not going to rain. If I go out and it's sunshiny and I don't have my umbrella, it rains. So it's like taking an umbrella out. It's the same thing. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to make it rain. It's just uncomfortable for a lot of people to talk about. Okay? It's not uncomfortable for me to speak about because I deal with it on a daily, weekly basis. And 
it's part of life. It's the only part of life that's guaranteed. Death is the only guarantee in life. Everybody says death and taxes, but I know a lot of people that don't pay their taxes. So let's just go with death. All right. So we're going to make sure your child has the stability that they need. If they lose you, we don't want them to have to be torn between court battle. Okay. So of course, for the worst case scenario, and you know your child to be safe because it's because they are in the hands of somebody that you chose, not the state. Worst case scenario is the state comes in, takes your child, puts them in foster care. Yes, there are a lot of great foster care parents out there, but you really don't want your child in, in, in the care of a stranger, especially when they've just lost you. So it's really good to make sure this is done now, okay? So your adult children, so I'm glad a couple of you do have children over 18. Now, your kids are not kids anymore, okay? I've got a 25-year-old and a 29-year-old. They're not kids anymore, but guess what? They still need mom and dad every once in a while, right? They need us for financial issues. They need us for medical issues. So I've got what I call a kid's transition plan. And that is to transition your kids into adulthood with your assistance, of course, all right? So because they're 18, you are not um, freely allowed to get their medical information. You're not freely allowed to tap into any of their finances. Um, I've had parents that, that have paid for a, a child's college tuition. So their name is all over the bill pay, they've done all this, and then they hear that their kid's not going to school, but they can't verify it because they call the school administration. The school administration says, I can't release that information to you. And the parent says, well, I'm paying thousands of dollars of tuition, you better give it to me. And the school administration is stuck by saying, I can't give it to you. A worst case scenario, a worst case that um, dealt with is a parent heard from the kid's roommate that they were in the hospital. Parent asked where, and they said, I don't know. They just, they just came and took him away and took him to a hospital. So the parent frantically called around to every hospital in the town where the college was, and every hospital said, I can't tell you that information. I can't tell you that information. HIPAA has prevented hospitals from releasing any information about a patient. She ended up having to fax her, her driver's license, a birth certificate, and a couple of other things. Uh, I don't remember exactly what, but she had to jump through so many hoops and do that for every hospital in order for them to tell her. Had she had the designation of medical surrogate or a healthcare directive for that child, she could have sent that to that hospital, one piece of paper, fax it to the hospital, the hospital could have gotten it and said, yes, your child is here and this is what's wrong. That parent would have had a much calmer day. Still, of course, frantic, but would have known that they have the resource that they need to get the information that they need to help their kid. So that's a kid's transition plan. The financial power of attorney um, and power of attorney over other issues would have allowed the other parent to get information from the school to see if their kid was skipping class. Now, yeah, the kid probably doesn't want that parent to know that, but that's what these documents are for. They're in place to remind the child that, hey, we've got this relationship, I'm still paying your bills, and you still need some guidance from us, and, and this is how it's gonna go. Now, that, that's a little different situation because those kids actually have to sign those documents. So it's a touchy conversation or it can be, um, but it's a really good one to have with your adult children um, to, to see if you can help them out. All right. So that's a kid's transition plan. And again, we're at the end here. So once again, nothing in this presentation should be interpreted as legal advice. This presentation is intended to help you understand the area of law, estate planning specifically, to help ask the right questions with the attorney of your choice. 
So now I'm actually going to turn it over to a little bit of q and I left a little bit of time at the end to do that. So if you have a question, please unmute yourself. I think you can do that and uh, ask away. Or if you just want to type in a question, we can read it from the uh, chat box. Anyone? Hey, Marty, I sent you one. I realized oh, it was- Andrew there. sent me one? I don't- I, I sent it privately, I realized. Oh, okay. All right. What's your question, uh, Andrew? Not a private one. It was just, you were talking about having alternates. So I was curious what you recommend for clients because I've had the situation come up where someone will come in and say, let's say I have my parents who are available to be a guardian, mm -hmm. but I don't really have a backup. I don't, or I have my siblings and I don't really have anyone that I would trust. So what do you suggest to someone who doesn't have an alternate- yeah. So I, and I, and I, I had that today. Like I mentioned, they, they, they only have their relatives in Australia. I'm like, you can't come up with somebody. And they said they just moved here. I guess they were living in New York or somewhere upstate or uh, the other area of the country for a while. I don't, sorry, I don't remember specifically where they were from. And they just moved here not too long ago, so they don't know anybody. And I said, well, okay, we'll, we'll get the, the, so this is exactly what happened today. Not today, but when I spoke to them about getting it set up. Um, let's, let's go ahead and get, your, get the people that you're naming on there, even though they're from Australia. And when you do have some relationships with some people that you would trust to watch your children until they could get here, let's revise the documents. And I'll revise them usually for no cost. It, it just really depends on what the situation is. Um, but yeah, you, you wanna have somebody. And that's why I throw out there, do not leave anybody out of that initial list. That initial list, I'm not kidding, is, should be 30 people long. Because I didn't mention that that's how long it should be. It should be 30 people. It should be your neighbors, your, your, uh, the people that uh, you see at school, at daycare, the daycare provider, if the daycare provider will even be a person, uh, somebody that you work with anybody you really want to make that list as big as possible and then go through the other the uh, other list of uh um qualifications mm -hmm. okay? and short term really doesn't have to have, be overly qualified they can just be a nice person that you trust will take care of your child until that other person gets there Right, the concern would be a, more of a long-term concern. Yeah, yeah, long-term, yes, of course. In long-term, yeah, we want to have a long-term. So in the case of parents who may be older, just make sure that client is aware to, hey, you, you really need to be starting, start to look for a secondary. And as the parents get older, they may need to revise that document. Now, if the parents, you know, they're, they're a young parent, like I'm a young grandparent, so... I hope I would be a viable <laughs> choice for, for several years to come. Uh, but yeah, you always want to have an altar. So have them keep searching, keep digging, um, and maybe they can come up with one and then you just modify the document. Hey, Marty, I think we have a few questions from... Okay, perfect. Do you want to read them off? Sure, from Liz, medical power of attorney for college kids. Right. Thanks, Liz. That was what I was just speaking about with the uh, kids' transition plan. Um, we can call it a, a, there are a lot of different terms for it. Here in Florida, we call it a designation of healthcare surrogate. It's a mouthful, um, but that's what it is. A lot of people refer to it as a medical power of attorney. Uh, the generic is a healthcare directive. So yes, we would, that is one of the documents so there are two documents we use for that kid's transition plan. It's a power of attorney or durable power of attorney, which is over financial and property issues and any other issue that you want to throw in there, even digital assets. So um, passwords for emails, Facebook, for social, any social media, passwords for anything. That's a, a new law that they actually finally, finally got passed uh, in the last year. Uh, and then the medical surrogate would be for medical decisions. And you should always have conversations with your kid about what if this happened? What would you want? It's a tough conversation. What if this happened? What would you want? And come up with as crazy of ideas as you want because I'm sure they've happened. All right? 
So Liz, that's, that's the answer. So yes, that's included in the uh, kids protection plan. And from Sharona, she asked, is there any official consent that's needed from the guardian or financial guardian? Official consent that they agree to being a guardian? No, there's no official consent that they have to sign. That's why the conversation is so important. Okay. From Felicia, do you recommend both a will and trust? <laughs> it depends. Depends on what assets you have. If you have assets, if you own real estate, I'm usually going to suggest a trust. That's something that we can discuss in a one-to-one -one conversation. Um, Gray, just put the box up there again. Please feel free to click on that link and set a time to speak with me, all right? Um, I'll be able to answer you in much more detail. I hate giving vague answers, but unfortunately, like I said in the, in the little disclaimer, um, I can't give legal advice, but yeah, it, most families are better off with the trust plan, which includes a trust, the will, power of attorney, healthcare directive, um, and, and uh, documents for minor children. If you have adult children, uh, we, can, we can throw those in for being on the, uh, on the chat today, or on the webinar today. I have another question from Liz. How to help, help kids whose parent invaded the trust? The parent was the guardian and the trustee. Can they garnish the parent's income? That's a little too specific for me to answer here. Um, and, and that's a whole nother area of administration. So that, that could actually go into fraud. Um, it could go into, it could actually be a, a, a criminal issue as well. So um, I, I can't really answer to that because I need really, really specific information, okay? Okay, and then from Wendy, what powers of attorney would be critical for the parent? adult you you cut out there what powers of attorney would be critical for the, uh, parent the parents of the young adult yeah yep, i think i i think i just covered that one so okay. we've got the durable power of attorney which is over finances um, property and really pretty much anything else um, we try to load as much as we can in there we can always pare it down if you don't want all that power um, but the durable power of attorney and then of course the medical power of attorney or medical surrogate and Jennifer is asking, what are the typical legal fees for guardianship designation documents, revocable trust, and wills? Okay. That's, 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 one with that's, you. A, that's a great, great question. All right. So uh, I charge a flat fee, which means it's a guaranteed rate. It is what it is. It's, and it comes with all of the documents, whether it's a will plan or a trust plan. And once again, the will plan has a will, power of attorney medical surrogate, living will. Did I, did I say power of attorney already? <laughs> Usually I have it written down, I can see. Um, and we'll put in the um, children's documents. And like I said, we will include the, um, the kids transition plan um, for, for one child in the, the fee. Uh, a trust plan has all those documents as well as a revocable trust. Okay. The will plan is 2000 the trust plan is 3000 So included with that is really unlimited uh, consultations for, with me to make sure everything is set up exactly as you want it to be set up and to help you get that trust funded, okay? If you want us to help you fund the trust, which means transfer assets um, besides real estate, the real estate transfer, if it's one or two deeds, we'll, we'll throw that in with the trust plan. Um, but if it's more and you need some assistance with us transferring uh, bank accounts, stock brokerage accounts, uh, transferring beneficiaries or changing beneficiaries to name the trust, um, we can help you, help you with that for an additional fee, all right? So most people are gonna come in at that two to $3,000 range. And really, it's, it's about having me by your side putting this all together and, and Whistler Law Firm as well. So, you know, we work as a team to get everything in place and make sure it does what we want it to do. Too often, um, I've seen people go online, 
get documents because they think two or three thousand dollars is expensive. They go online, they find it for a couple hundred or a few hundred or five hundred, and that then they think they're done. They have set up a trust, they spend that money to do that, and then the the relatives come to me and say, Hey, we got this set up. I said, Yeah, but nothing was in there, so it's not done. So now we have to go to probate. And probate costs anywhere from three to ten thousand or even more, just depends on the assets. So and six months, 12 months, 18 months of just really headache of going to court. So look at the cost comparison. Um, the two to $3,000 is, is peace of mind. So you really can't put a price tag on peace of mind for you and your family. That was a long-winded answer to your question, but that's-, uh, that's, that's Do you also part. do elder law, power of attorneys, et cetera? Um, Okay, so elder law is a very specific set, subset of estate planning. So power of attorneys for seniors, yeah, if they have the proper mental capacity, okay? Families with small children have more moving parts than older retirees, okay? My area that I chose to, to focus on is the, um, I guess they're the sandwich generation. They're the generation that has kids, young kids, and they also have parents that are aging. They're, they're baby boomers, they're getting ready to retire. So yes, I deal with both of those populations. Now, if you're talking about Medicaid planning, where somebody can qualify for Medicaid, uh, I don't do that, but I do work with an attorney that does. Um, if you are talking about anything that has to do with elder abuse or, any other type of elder where it's only talking about the geriatric uh, uh, population, I probably don't do that, but I probably also know somebody that does. So any questions you have about those, you can certainly send my way and we can get, get it figured out. All right, All right we've got in, uh, Marty's email in case you want to email him any questions and then his time trade link is there you can schedule a complimentary consultation with them and discuss everything one-on-one -on -one. thank you Gray. yeah so um, if you don't have any more questions uh, we can wrap it up otherwise we do have time for probably one more question did you get through them all or was that uh... yeah that was it okay super last chance anybody Thanks, Marty. All right. Well, thank you all very much. I really appreciate uh, you coming to our webinar. And uh, we look forward to working with all of you. Don't forget to sign up for that free consultation, and we'll get you set up. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I'll hang out, I'll hang out in here for a little while, just in case somebody has a question, OK? Feel, OK. Feel free to leave. All right. Bye. Bye.